Okay, in the interest of time, we're going to get going here. Hi, everybody. I'm Brad Rathgaber, the head of school of One Schoolhouse, and I'm joined today by my good friend, Jeff Shields, the president and CEO of NBOA, the National Business Officers Association. Hey, Jeff. That's right. Hi, Brad. How are you doing today? I'm so excited to have you here because thanks that uh, it's really important for academic leaders to understand school finances in order to create solutions that can really fit within um, the means of schools. And yet uh, we know that historically, although I think this is changing, the academic side of the house has typically tuned out the business side of the house and the business side of the house historically <laughs> tuned out the academic side of the house. And I know you and I have both been working for a long time to help change that quite a bit. Uh, that's that's correct. I mean, I, th I really think what's changed is that uh, the head of school uh, has really seen how uh, understanding the business model, developing their financial chops, et cetera, ha has been really not only valuable, but really expected by the trustees at this point in time. And, and uh, not to let the business officers off the hook, um, you know, they can't just shrug their shoulders and say, I don't need to know anything about the program. I don't need to know anything about student learning. I don't need to know anything about anything other than the numbers. I do think those days are long gone. And the most effective schools, I think, are led by uh, heads of school, other academic leaders, and the business officer working together in partnership. I, I couldn't agree more. So, so Jeff, can we just dive into a couple of questions? Sure. And then as I ask a couple of starter questions here, folks, if you have questions as well for Jeff, please just click the Q&A button and type your question in. Uh, and Jasper and I will manage the questions that come in that way. Uh, we're not right. using the chat function, though, for questions, folks. We're just using that Q&A button. So use the Q&A button if you have questions. So, Jeff, as we head into this, uh, this kind of new normal or new whatever we want to kind of call it, mm. um, uh, I think it's important for academic leaders to understand the state of business and operations in independent schools kind of on our way into this COVID-19 crisis. Sure, sure. Well, uh, you know, there's no denying that the business model for schools uh, already had had numerous challenges. Uh, even after, I, I still think back, and maybe it's because it's when I first started with MBOA, I still think back to 10 years ago and uh, the impact that the economic downturn had on independent schools. And, and you know, independent schools even had some lead time and really saw that coming. Um, and that was nearly 10 years ago. Uh, but but not a whole lot changed over the last decade. I would say until the last year, and I'll get to that. But I, I do think uh, as we went into this pandemic, most schools are very uh, reliant on tuition. Um, I'd go further, I'd say most schools are very reliant on fundraising. Uh, and, uh, and that's a real challenge. That was, a, that was a challenge for schools this past year and going into this environment. Um, I think some other characteristics I'd share with the folks that are tuned in today was that um, we were seeing steady uh, enrollment overall, but, but really very little growth. Uh, now, of course, I'm talking about across the board nationwide, um, and, and certainly independent schools enrollment experiences could vary. We could see some that were in decline uh, and some that, that did see uh, modest increases, but net-net, the overall number of students enrolled in independent schools in our schools hasn't really, uh, really in, uh, grown uh, much over the last several years. Uh, I already mentioned um, fundraising. Uh, we saw that softening. Um, so that was challenging for schools in filling that gap, you know, the, the gap between how much we, we actually charge net tuition uh, and how much we collect net tuition per student uh, and, and what we need to do to keep the school running. So uh, I think that was something that was happening. A little good news, endowment performance was actually pretty strong. Uh, again, before the pandemic, it's been a roller coaster ride ever since, but it was relatively strong. Um, and I think these these factors combined, what, what I thought was really interesting was over the past year really helped drive schools to experiment with new tuition models and different financial aid models. And, and these have included uh, tuition reset. I, we saw a really bold uh, tuition reset by uh, Southern New Hampshire University lately, where they reduced their tuition 
$39,000 to $10,000. Um, and again, that's because um, they rely heavily on online learning. So it's interesting we're having this conversation with you and, and our one schoolhouse colleagues across the country. Um, so, but, but, but independent schools have been doing that. Uh, we saw uh, the Kiskey School, an all-boys boarding school, do a significant tuition reset. One of the first boarding schools that I was aware of doing that. Montgomery School did a tuition reset uh, to be more competitive in their particular market. Um, and then, of course, index tuition. And, and I'm just going to... Uh, I'm going to just clarify that I don't believe that when index tuition, the program is really done properly. I don't think it's just a fancy uh, new way of describing financial aid. Of course, it involves financial aid, but schools that are really doing it well uh, are really doing it strategically so they can offer a, a wide variety of tuition price points and offer their students and families lots of flexibility while still honing in on the net tuition revenue that they need to collect. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there. All of these things were ways of opening the funnel and expanding our market. Um, of course, boarding schools were under tremendous pressure uh, and still are. Um, and I think uh, one characteristic, again, pre-pandemic that I found most troubling was the data showing us that families, even with the means to pay our tuition, um, were still not selecting our independent schools. And, and that was really challenging. And again, it goes back to how can we open that funnel? How can we bring more people in? And I think this was most evident and probably most people on the call uh, would be able to observe that we saw a softening in lower school enrollment. Um, uh, and, and yet, at the same time, for some schools, depending on your program, we did see much stronger demand uh, for high school. Um, so I think those were the, the key characteristics that I was observing, and, and I'm sure many schools uh, were discussing even prior uh, to the onset of the pandemic. So if the landscape, at least nationally, again, again, we're talking kind of biggest of pictures, yep. and we know yep. that there are some differences on regions and market specific markets. Um, so if at least nationally, we were not talking about the rosiest of pictures heading into um, this, although we were talking about schools innovating on yes. a whole variety of levels. Right, that's right. What, um, what challenges are now emerging to our financial and operational model in this new kind of COVID-19 environment? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Obviously, we've been and thinking a lot about it. Uh, MBOA has been working really uh, diligently with partners like NEIS and EMA and, and uh, state and regional associations. I, I've, I actually, Brad, haven't seen a coming together of all of the different associations serving independent schools, one schoolhouse, certainly no exception uh, in, in, in this type of way uh, in response to the pandemic, which gives you a sense of kind of how extraordinary and, and how uh, challenging this environment is for everybody. So I just want to say first and foremost that, you know, business officers, the financial model, everyone is concerned about the safety and health of our school communities. That, that's top of mind. Uh, and frankly, I'm relieved that to date, I'm not aware of any major outbreak uh, within any school community um, that we've seen in, in other types of communities and other types of workplaces. So there's certainly been some positive cases and there's certainly been some exposure but, but certainly not an outbreak. And I, I'm pretty confident we would have heard about that by now. And, uh, and we have it. So that's, that's really the good news. Schools responded, schools, schools reacted, and we're really, we're really on top of it. Um, I think what's happening right now is, as you well know, probably better than anybody, schools are managing this, dis, the, whatever distance learning solution that they've implemented, whatever they, they've put in place, um, and, and really, um, I think now making decisions about the status of bringing students back to campus this year, which I think is really challenging and hard. And, you know, I think about my daughter's an eighth grader and the move up ceremony um, that we realize she's going to have in a virtual way and not in a, a person to person way. Of course, any high school senior, it just, uh, I, you know, I, I had an amazing high school experience. And I think about any high school senior with all those milestones and not being able to really access them. So I think schools are, are weighing those decisions heavily and also being creative about how to serve the community and serve those students in, in different ways. Um, we're making decisions about summer programs and, and really how, how are we going to end this year if we are in a virtual environment? Um, I do want to shout out that I know many heads of schools and many trustees and business officers are grappling with the PPP loan uh, application process. I don't know whether- Jeff, can uh, that, you pause there for one second? What is the yeah. PPP loan for those that are it, not? It, yeah, it, 
I appreciate that question. It is a, uh, a new program, a federal, federal program uh, administered by uh, Small Business Administration. Uh, Payroll Protection Program is PPP, and it allows uh, schools who choose to do so, it's up to their it's up to the individual school to apply, work with their bank, um, to access resources, funds um, that can be forgiven uh, depending on certain circumstances. I don't think it's helpful to go into the details now, but it's really to help schools um, uh, support the teachers uh, and all the administrators and everyone who's on the payroll. So uh, I think what's important for your audience to know is that 75% of the funds, if a school uh, was going to secure those at minimum, would have to go towards payroll. So that means we keep every employed, which is a good thing. And then up to 25% can also be used for facilities, which we're still paying for our, our facilities. We're still maintaining them. Uh, we're still doing a lot of things around our facilities. So um, I just wanted to call that out because there's a lot of comp uh, compliance issues associated with it. A lot of trustees, boards, and business officers are all grappling with it. And I just I just think I'd be remiss for not mentioning that this is going on in the backdrop, although I, it, it does not directly impact uh, academic leaders at this point. Um, and then obviously the big question is, how's this gonna affect enrollment? And, and if enrollment's impacted, um, I think everyone on the call knows that budgets are impacted. And the correlation between our tuition revenue and our uh, salary and benefits is, is you know, undeniable. Um, and so um, if we do experience enrollment challenges, we will experience some, some uh, we will have to respond budgetarily. Yeah, so let's let's pause there actually for a second. And again, folks, if you have specific questions for Jeff, please don't hesitate to put them into the Q&A here. Um, let's tie together two things that you just said. So yeah. the, when I asked you the first question, you talked about how schools have become more reliant upon tuition, mm -hmm. which now makes us reliant upon enrollment yes. during this time mm -hmm. significantly more than we might have been even a generation ago. Yes, yes. What? Just to give folks a sense for a bit of, um, to make sure that we're kind of understanding the, 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 the landscape on this, about how much of a percentage of schools annual revenue is coming in from tuition these days? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, according to our biz data most recently from the most uh, current year, current fiscal year, um, I would say you can ballpark it between 70 and 80 percent, depending on the school. Could be a little higher, could be a little lower. It depends. Yep. But most schools fall into that sweet spot. And, and you also mentioned that so much of a school's expenses are in faculty and staff uh, mm -hmm. between benefits and salary. Yep. About what does biz data tell us is about there? I would put that number around 60 to 70. Again, it varies. Gotcha. So it's slightly under, but you can see the relationship is, is clear. And it's the same for many, many nonprofits across the country, that relationship between your primary revenue stream and your primary expense, which is investing in your staff. Right. Um, so that kind of leads me to my next question, uh, which I think is very much related to these two things. And that is, what actions can academic leaders consider taking that can help their school thrive both during this crisis and then as a follow up to the crisis? Well, I really appreciate that question. I want to acknowledge that this this is a slightly out of my lane, uh, yeah. but I I because I don't I don't often um, give advice directly to academic leaders. But since we're talking about business finance and operations, I feel comfortable doing so. I also um, just want to give uh, a little bit of a shout out that I've I've had the privilege of serving on the one schoolhouse board for the last seven years, and and serving side by side with academic leaders from across the country that are leading, that are innovating. Um, I've learned so much from that experience, so I feel a little bit more uh, I'm on firmer ground with uh, with venturing into this area uh, for you and the folks that have dialed in. Um, so I think what is most pressing right now, and, and again, I don't want to belie and I, I don't want to do a disservice to the innovation and the experimentation uh, that, that schools uh, have been doing um, in real time to address some of these big issues that we are grappling with. But I, I think right now what comes to mind for me is, is really the expectations game, right? Because we've been put on notice uh, about our need to transition from uh, in-person, face-to-face learning environment where all of our students are in the classroom together to some kind of distance learning environment. Um, we didn't know that before, but we know it now. 
And yeah. so I think that if the need arises again, which again, we, we're in incredibly uncertain times, but if the need arises to get again, schools are going to have to toggle uh, from opening to distance learning uh, again sometime in this next school year. Is it the fall? Is it the winter? I don't know. Um, but if from where I sit, we're going to have to do it better and even faster than we did this year. And I want to say we did really well. Um, mm -hmm. Schools responded. And I'm hearing that again and again and again. And it's really exciting um, to hear that story being told, how well the faculty responded, how well the students have responded, um, and how, um, how we, you know, I think it's fair to say how we demonstrated how agile uh, we could be compared to some other um, offerings that are out there, some other K through 12 options that are out there. So I think schools have been remarkable in this regard. And at the beginning, we were understanding a little flat-footed but ultimately delivered and I think that's something we should all be proud of I do think next year we have to be even more prepared I think the transition has to be even more seamless and I know as you and I have discussed it could even mean opening distance learning um, opening again and then distance learning it could be that kind of environment again whatever schools feel able to manage and what of course whatever in the best interest of their students so um, Toggling back and forth throughout the year is not out of question. And, and I think supporting students and families um, with this kind of uh, potential environment as not only the school circumstances demand, but as their family circumstances demand uh, with parents who are working or trying to work and trying to help their students. I think that's, I think that's going to be something that's on, on the horizon or absolutely something we have to be prepared to do. And, and I, do, I do think in the spirit of really never wasting a good crisis, you and I, and having worked with one schoolhouse for so long, think about the number of faculty that now have had direct experience with distance learning. Yeah. That's, that's just incredible to me to think about that. Um, but you know what? It's been almost entirely on the job training and yeah. it's been almost entirely under you know, a lot of pressure. In, in a time constrained moment. So um, I, I think, think about the opportunity we have to help our faculty uh, be more planful, be more reflective um, and, and, and prepare for that type of learning module. I think that's, um, I think that's really exciting. And I think that's, that's what I believe we have the opportunity to leverage from an academic standpoint um, in this moment. And, and I know that schools will be concerned about expenses just like anyone else. Um, but you know, I'd really like to ha have the conversation or encourage schools to have the conversation that it's really doubtful we'll be spending a lot of PD money on travel, um, hotel or airfare in this next year, but let's not abandon our professional development budgets, but, but really shift those investments to online opportunities for our faculty to really um, get up to speed and advance uh, their uh, skills and abilities that, like I said, they learned in, in not the most ideal circumstances. Um, so, I mean, those are some of the initial thoughts I have. If, if you uh, have other questions or if other folks have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, ha happy to hear you say that too, Jeff. I know that uh, NIS last week did a SNAP survey of heads of school. Yep. Uh, and then that SNAP survey, somewhere between 50 and 60% of schools said that they were considering cutting their professional development budgets next year. Um, what I'm hearing you say is that might not be the best, the best course of action, or at least schools should be thinking about reallocating their professional development budgets differently than they had previously. Right. And I, I really think it's I really think it's an opportunity because I think if we do, if we want to prepare for, um, you know, the some 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 difficult circumstances uh, as it relates to enrollment, well, certainly there might be an opportunity to reduce PD. Like I said, sometimes the most expensive part of professional development is getting on a plane uh, right. and paying for that hotel. It's, it's generally not registration fees um, uh, unto themselves. So I think there's a lot of people in this space who are trying to offer that, uh, offer that learning. I think obviously uh, One Schoolhouse is, is one resource. Um, but I really think if, if we're going to leverage this opportunity and we're 
really going to ask our communities and our faculty to rise to the occasion, we, we really have to support it. I mean, uh, kind of the same subject, but different. But one of the most frustrating things I think a business officer can experience is, is investing in technology and then going into a classroom and still seeing it sitting in the box in the corner. And you know what? That, there's no one's fault. We, we have, if we could create more time, that would be great. But we, we, that's the most precious commodity. But really, very often, it's not about the faculty not wanting to use the technology or the business officer not dedicating the resources. It really comes down to the additional training and support. Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes we um, uh, shorthand that. And yeah. I don't think we can. And, and like I said, I really believe given how well schools performed in this environment, I think it could be a real key differentiator for schools going forward if they they leverage what they've already done and, and invest in it, you know, like in it, like an endowment, but anything you invest in it and that's when it will pay the most dividends. And I think schools who want to be adept and agile, like we said around this, are going to need the training and support to do that. Yeah, you know, Jeff, I think that's a that's a really good point. Um, if folks have questions, please don't hesitate to put them into the q and I'm going to uh, ask you, Jeff, to if sure. you can talk for maybe a minute or two about yep. a new resource that you guys just had last week, where you had a webinar that has been talked that has been the talk <laughs> of independent school administrators recently uh, yeah. about safety and operations, kind of heading into this fall. Um, and we're and good. No, we're going to talk more about that. But um, yes, absolutely. I think that has been top of mind. Um, there were a couple things that I think happened last week. We, we took two perspectives. Uh, McLean Middleton really brought um, some really expert uh, medical advice um, to the MBOA community last week that I think really helped um, give folks pathways to think about, but it really, it, it was expert advice and it was clear, which is sometimes on sh in short supply in, in this kind of uh, world we're living in, but it helps schools think about everything uh, from, from transportation to food service to uh, obviously the health uh, and safety of our faculty and staff, but gave, um, gave the folks on the call, and it was way beyond business officers, um, I think a lot of clarity around that. And then, and then fast forward, we also did uh, some work last week around um, facilities and preparing our yeah. facilities for the next reopen and what that looks like. You know, one thing I forgot to mention about the great work our schools are doing, and I really want to say something, um, I want to thank you to uh, Edmund Burke School in Washington, D.C., which is, the, uh, my daughter attends there, she's an eighth grader, um, and it's the six through 12 school in D.C. And it is, uh, you know, I have a focus group of one with my eighth grade daughter who's attending independent school. And it's amazing to me how resilient she's been in this environment. And it's, it's really inspiring. And it's all because of the support of great teachers, as we all know, everything happens because of great teachers but the engagement she's having in this environment the, the agency that you know I know we talk a lot about at one schoolhouse um, the expectations it's just really great and it just reminds me yet again that that students are ready to step up to the challenge you know as we talk about potentially toggling back and forth um, you know it's really uh, I, I and I believe that schools will be able to meet them again if they if they make the right decisions now Jeff, you know, I'm going to leave it there because I think that's a great place to leave this discussion. Sure. And we're going to make sure that and the uh, when we post this up on YouTube and we put the transcripts in here, we're going to put the links to the two great MBOA webinars that we just mentioned. Terrific. Thank you. Um, but I think that that's such a nice place to end it. And I also want folks on the call to know, and I think you do because you've seen a couple of these emails go out this week, that One Schoolhouse is going to be releasing a whole bunch of new resources tomorrow for schools that will help with this toggle that Jeff's talking about. That's great. So I think we'll end it there. But Jeff, thank you so much for sharing what you uh, sharing this insights with academic leaders. I know that um, sometimes it's difficult for academic leaders to really, really want to jump into those business and operations conversations. <laughs> yeah. But I think you've made this uh, accessible to folks um, and uh, and given great information. So thank you. Well, thanks for the opportunity, Brett, and thanks to you and all the great work that One Schoolhouse and your whole team is doing. I know I know many many schools appreciate it. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, bye -bye. have a good day. Bye-bye.